when the leaders of care organizations need to buy technology, they're presented with a maze of options and navigating this maze can be very difficult. To understand how to navigate the maze of care technology companies out there, I organized to speak with Geraint Thomas, who is the managing director of Guided Innovation. In this episode, we talk about why care leaders have such a hard time identifying digital solutions, how to avoid going down dead ends when it comes to buying care technology, and the technology issues that should be considered when working with an ICS. My name's Simon Parker, and this is the Care Leaders Network podcast. So here goes, buying care technology. How do you navigate the maze? Garen, let's jump straight in. Why is it that care leaders have such a hard time identifying digital solutions that are right for them? It's it's really difficult um, to identify what you're looking for. For a start, you know, often people will start with a conversation with networks and friends, or they'll start with a Google search. How many times have everybody sat in front of Google trying to think of what to type in? If we take digital care planning, you could type in care planning, e-care planning, digital care plan care plans, ICSs. You know, there's loads of things type of people type in to try and find products they want. And often it's broader than that. They're even typing in digital solutions for social care, digitalizing my care home. And you are putting these very broad terms in. And guess what? The top results are the largest providers of software out there that can afford to get to the top of your results. And that is going to mislead a lot of people into thinking perhaps they're the best products to find. And very rarely will people, when researching the market, ever go into page two, three or four of Google. And there are fantastic products in page three and four of a Google search. Um, so, I mean, that that's one big area where people struggle to find the products they want. The other thing is, I will point the finger at suppliers and suggest perhaps their marketing isn't as good to the point as it could be, you know, hopefully um, lots of people in the sector have been to these big events like the Care Show, um, Health Plus Care, these big events that go on every year. And how many of us have gone up to a stand, stared at the, the, the marketing in the background and still not known what they do? <laughs> and that draws you into a conversation with a salesperson who is a fantastic salesperson. And it might not be what you were looking for, but you're still stuck there for half an hour learning about something you weren't going to buy anyway. <laughs> So, you know, you are almost doomed uh, by a sector that's trying to sell to you. Um, and therefore, they don't want to make it easy. They want to make you go down some dead ends. It's interesting what you said about being beholden to uh, your, your Google search. Of course, you've got two different types of search results that are going to come up. You've got the people that are really, really good at SEO. And then you've got the people that are really, really good at paid advertising or that maybe even they're paying the most uh, amount for their for their paid advertising. I have always thought that like, and th this applies to everything over and above technology in the, in the, in the social care sector. Um, but, but, but yeah, it's, you're not necessarily, the Google search is not necessarily indicative of the, the absolute best that's out there. And I've had some interesting experiences with, uh, with that when trying to find new products and services for, for myself, where it's, 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 uh, it's not necessarily given the results that I've been looking for. So I can, I can really connect with that particular, particular point. Um, I also completely hear what you're saying around some of the <clears throat> branding and marketing efforts made by all, all companies. Again, this is a re relatively broad, broad problem, I'd say, but it, it, there are lots of organizations out there that will their positioning and their almost their brand architecture and things sounds compelling. But does it really give you that kind of does it? Is it is it Ron Seal? Is it explaining? Is it do, does it do exactly what it says on the tin? Because if it doesn't, that then creates a certain amount of confusion and ambiguity, and it 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 slows down that market research process. So I guess the point is that the 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 the, the, the care leader, whilst they're starting this conversation uh, or this uh, or, or, or or this exploration process, if you uh, if you like, it's there are reasons why it becomes complicated before we, before you even start speaking to the suppliers themselves as well, which, uh, yeah, just slows the whole process down. And as we know, care leaders, I don't know any that aren't time poor. So it's more frustrating from the get go, which is which is tough. Um, you know, sadly, the search engines are not your friend in this. I think they were for a long time, but sadly, they got to a point now where, you know, the paid for advertising is coming up top. For example, if you 
do type in something like digital rostering or epilepsy mats or whatever it might be, you're going to get um, a supplier come top. They will also come slightly down the screen again. And if they're really good with their blogs and articles, their LinkedIn bit will come up as well. So one supplier playing three times on the first page. So you've got to be quite critical as you're going through your search results and go, you know, I'm not just going to look at the top three. Do you need to go digging? And again, when you're that Ronsil example is great. Very rarely is it that self-explanatory when you go in there. And and I the number of times I've had somebody go, oh, look, I've got this really cool app. And it does look really cool. And then I dig a bit and go, well, what do you do? What's your company do? They're a recruitment company. They're an agency or a recruitment company with a cool app. And the app draws you in and then trying to sell you agency. Um, and yeah, so you, you, you want to be very critical as you're going around these and really probe and probe and don't smile at them um, until you're really confirmed that they're, they're what you want. Got you. That makes, uh, that, that makes sense. So, okay, so let's enter the maze. How do people avoid going about getting stuck down dead ends? And how does one go and negotiate a route that has a, 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 like a positive outcome when it comes to doing market research and due diligence on prospective digital solutions? All right, that's a big one, isn't it? There's a few steps I can give you, like like navigating any maze. <laughs> you know, ideally a top-down view of the maze would help. Now, the where to start? Understand what you're looking for. That is a key one. Um, I would encourage you not to type in, how do I digitalize my care plan? How do I use data? These are too broad. You want to narrow that down. Know what you're seeking to buy. Are, are you digitalizing your rostering? Do you need a HR project product? Are you looking for a CRM? Is it assistive technology, sensors? You know, know what you're looking for and hone your focus in on that. When you know what you want, speak to staff. Speak to people in your organization a lot. This is something that's very rarely done. Um, and often it stays at a senior level in an organization. You might ask other senior people outside of your organization, but please speak to your staff around, hi, we're thinking of buying epilepsy maps, rostering, care planning, whatever it might be. What's your thoughts? What would you need it to do? What would you like it to do? Have you heard of any good ones? Have you used good ones? Do you know someone that's used a good one? And, and start gathering that. It's giving you terms then to type into Google. Go searching. Look up ones that people have said to you. Um, type into Google, you know, this, this supplier's competitors. You'll find a list of them somewhere. Now you've got yourself some to Google specifically and go through. So that that's starting to navigate the maze a little bit for you. Just find the names of a few and type in things like. So let's, let's use some examples. Um, two of the largest... A digital care planning products uh, on the market is PCS and Nourish. These products own a lot of the market share and they're both very good. You know, find those names out, type them in and look at them. Then type in PCS is, comp <laughs> you know, systems like PCS, things like that. And you're going to find a lot more. Um, somebody out there will have given you a spreadsheet uh, <laughs> that you'll be able to download and things like that. So that, that's a really neat, neat route through the maze. How do you know it's not a dead end? <laughs> when you find one you like, and you'll find a few you like. In all aspects of digital, you should find three or four products that you like. Please choose the cheapest. <laughs> That's a dead end. Please do not do that. Um, cheapest, you can relate to price equals quality of product. I got some great advice once from a wine taster. Uh, and he said, you can either go into wine tasting or buy the most expensive wine you can afford because the price will reflect the taste of the wine. It's the same in soft. Does tend to follow features. So, so how, what do you judge it on if it's not priced at that point? Look at all the products, get good in-depth demos of all three products that you'd like the look of. Bring people you spoke to from your business at all levels into that room to see the product too. Then Speak to people who have used the products and that will ensure on these dead ends. You're seeing them, you're getting informed views uh, and the one you then go forward and pick should be the route out of the maze. It should be one that does it. But I've got to say, and this is a soundbite that really I want to resonate with as many people as I can. 
if you've narrowed the market down to two or three products, they will all work for you. If you've managed to get yourself to that point, it doesn't matter which one you buy, any of those three will deliver for your organization in whatever you're trying to solve. Yes, one of the things that people are going to be thinking about is there's so much choice out there. How does one go about telling the difference between a good salesperson with a bad <laughs> product or, 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 a, or a good salesperson with a with, with a good product because they'll, they'll they're gonna sound brilliant uh either of those two could potentially sound sound brilliant so i i think that's an important one to to, to unpack as uh as well so it's it's really kind of seeing through um the potential for any bs and just really getting to the point around exactly what it what the product is and how good it is yeah that's really good question Let's take a moment and think about the product, the, the software you're trying to buy, the technology. You want products that are easy to use, reliable, give you lots of features of what you want to do, give you good return on investment, um, are integratable, that you can integrate them with other systems. They give you good reporting and data. You know, hopefully I'm, I'm ticking a few boxes there for people about the things you look for when you look for a product. None of those none of those are a good salesperson or, or any of those things. What you want is good developers in a software company to give you all those things, not salespeople or account managers or support people or all the things that the salespeople will sell to you. You've got to see past these. And, I, and, and it's the two sides. There's really good salespeople that can sell you a mediocre. And there are bad salespeople out there that have a fantastic product that you might overlook because you didn't get on with the salesperson. And I've been there in, in both examples. Um, you've got to measure the product on its own merits, please. Um, don't, all right, take with a pin and the salesperson's telling you. Um, one of the best sales pitches I saw just recently, a couple of weeks back, was you know somebody stood in front of a, a 20 people in the demo and said, just be very clear, I'm not a salesperson. I'm one of the developers. And I was like, okay, that's good. I like it. BS, he was a salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> they found a developer with with, with poor building skills and threw him in front of clients. Um, so yeah, you know, be, be very careful of these salespeople. Um, the product is what you're measuring. See the product. Throw the salesperson off. They'll skip a screen. They always do. Ask them to go back to that screen and explain it to you. How do I put a new resident on? How do I put a staff member on? Show me some reports. And they'll bring up a big list of reports. And they'll always click on the one they like and, and works. Ask them to show you another report. Measure the product, not the salesperson. So, yeah. Uh, deviate them if you can let's give them a chance if you can send a scenario to the software company before the demo i want you to demonstrate how you use your product to do this scenario and that throws the pitch out and they have to show you screens maybe they wouldn't have been showing you otherwise um yeah definitely a scenario or two or three to follow um, and it does upset the salespeople. they'll get they'll ring you <laughs> they will ring you are you sure you want to show us that? Yeah, we do. So as somebody that's spent my entire professional career working in sales and marketing, uh, uh, this is a world that I know uh, incredibly well. <laughs> and one of the things that I'd, I'd say is there are there are two different types of salespeople. There are people who help their company sell and there are people who help their customers buy. And those are two very, very different types of uh, types of salespeople. If you can find somebody that's really, really helpful when it comes to buying, part of their modus operandi should be helping you determine whether making the decision around making the purchase of your particular product or service um, is the right thing for, 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 for you. And it should be part of the discussion around, okay, so... I need to work out whether this is a thumbs up, let's do this, or a thumbs down, let's not do this. And the more they're able to give you data points and context and experiences of other people that can help you make that decision, the more helpful that 
salesperson is being because the result of them helping you buy is that they are the result of that is that they make a make a sale but they're making the right sale because everyone's bought a piece of technology, a product or service, whatever it might be. It ends up not being the right product or service. And let's just be completely honest, it's a massive pain in the ass because the company isn't happy because they end up losing a customer relatively uh, relatively quickly. And the person yeah. that has, if it, presuming we are talking about technology for a second, integrating technology is really, really hard. Having to then retrospectively go in and go, actually, no, that's the wrong piece of kit. We're going to have to take it out. You've then got to the multi-stakeholder management and all the people that you've persuaded to adopt this particular piece of kit to then have to go back and go, yeah, you know what, guys, we made the uh, made the wrong decision here, folks. We're going to have to head off in a slightly different dis- uh, direction. The implications of that are not fun. Uh, and uh, of course, it's just time time wasted where you could be focused on focusing on embedding a piece of tech or product or service, whatever it m- might be, that that is the right thing. So, um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to kind of double... Um, underline the particular point that you'd highlighted there and I guess share some uh, experience directly from being in the sales and marketing world but then also having bought products and services myself and experienced what those two different character types feel like and also why one would be certainly more preferable over the other. Now you can't guarantee you're always going to get one or, one or the other. Um, so to your point, you need to be able to cut through the cut through the noise and get to the get to the point. But you should be onto a winner if you've got somebody who's really really open, who really wants to help you to make that decision and is very open when it comes to supporting you with your buying journey. And if that means going back a couple of pages, if that means doing a particular demonstration on a particular part, if that means dealing with curveballs air quote curveballs um that the uh the uh the person making the buying decision is trying to uh trying to make that should be met with accommodation and uh uh, uh excitement almost that they're trying to trying to help you to uh to come to a come to a good conclusion yeah totally this this sector is full of both types of the sales people Definitely. And I love, love the way you've explained that, Sam. You're right. We want more of those salespeople that are supporting the care leader to make the right decision. And, you know, if this goes wrong, it goes horribly wrong. And I think we've all been there. I, I was um, uh, doing a talk at the care show. I think it was a couple of years back. And audience, put your hand up if you've bought a piece of software and never taken it live. And almost half of the room put their hand up. And that's wow. heartbreaking. Um, and then I asked, OK, Hands up if you've bought the right system and have taken 20% of the product live. Every hand in the audience went up. And it's if you buy a product and and you don't implement it, you don't roll it out in the way that it's meant, and you haven't got the supplier relationship that wants to partner with you and grow your use of their product, then, yeah, you just end up with a very expensive replacement to your Excel. Um, And, yeah, it there's a right way of doing this and yeah we'll we'll get into that expensive in both time and money as uh, as well of course and where where um uh, uh where 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 budgeting from uh, a, a financial perspective and time is so uh, so limited uh, both of those two things are, are have have more pressure than than ever making a, a wrong decision can be uh, really really detrimental and have have negative implications as we've uh, as we've talked about so talk to me about like outlining uh, a scoping and procurement journey that a care leader might undertake to arrive at a digital solution that's really going to meet their specific needs. Okay, so this this is my bread and butter. And, and, and I've got a really neat map of the maze for people to follow. And what I'll do is I will share that map um, with, with this this recording uh, when it goes out. So any, anybody can have access to this bit of a cheat sheet, really, um, to navigate. First and foremost, start out with requirement gathering. You think you want a digital care plan solution because everyone's telling you you want a digital care plan solution. Um, Speak to your staff. So often people say to me, Geraint, do you know anything about digital care plans? I go, I know everything about them. Oh, brilliant. We've just we're thinking of buying this. And I say to them, that's a terrible idea. That product is wonderful for elderly care no good for learning disabilities. Why are you buying it? And they go, whoops, which one should we buy, Geraint? And I say, don't ask me, ask your staff and the people they're working alongside. So please get out there, um, spend time out in services, speaking to staff, 
their managers and team leaders. Speak to the people that they're supporting, working alongside. Speak to them and their families. If you speak to all of these stakeholders, you will get an incredibly broad set of requirements. They'll say, I want to be able to take photos. I want to be able to share this with my mum. I want to be able to see this. I want to be able to help let somebody live, relive their memories. But you will get a set of requirements. Write them all down. Bullet point. Don't go into detail necessarily, but bullet points. Sadly, I'm warning you, you will have nearly 100. 100 or maybe 300. You will have a large set of bullet points. Take that. That is your requirements. Now you know what you want to buy. You know what you're looking for in the maze. Brilliant. Now, research and it is research if you've got anyone in your teams that good at research give it to them to do go three four pages deep on google reviews on google um searches sorry and research use different words and keep going in make a big list do what i said earlier find a product that does it and ask what their competitors are or products like it and you'll get other lists formulate a, a little table of all the products you find. It'll be 10, 20. It'll be a big chunk of, of, of products. It's research still. Hold your requirements up against these products. Don't you do it. Make the software guys do it. <laughs> Send each of those people that list of requirements that you gathered from your staff, that 120 point list. Say to them, can you just tick against these which ones you're going to do? Don't make the poor software providers send you screenshots and paragraphs against each one. Just ask for an honest, which of these do you do, which do you not? You'll get responses back. You've instantly shortlisted from a long list, instantly. At the same point, perhaps ask them what their list price is for their product. What's their licensing model? You're going to go straight from, a hundred, from 10 products down to your four very quickly from this. Well done, you just shortlisted. Then it's Dragon's Den time. <laughs> when you went out and spoke to people, you will have identified bright sparks in your organization that are keen for the technology you're procuring. Invite those people to the demos. Don't be shy about getting 20 people in a room for the supplier to come and demo to. Under no circumstances should it just be the exec. Always bring people from across your organization to the demos. Then Dragon's Den, you know, hour and a half demo, depending on what product you're buying, that, that number changes. But, you know, an hour and a half demo, you can fit three of them in in the day. Take two days in a row out for these 20 people. You know, I'm asking a lot. I know I'm asking a lot. But a couple of days out, come into a head office or, or rent a, a room somewhere in a, in a hotel and, and parade these suppliers in, three, four, five of them, however many you shortlisted down to, one after another. And that's quite important because you want to compare them. You want to see them side by side. If you get one demo on a Wednesday afternoon and then another demo Wednesday afternoon the next week and another demo Wednesday afternoon the next, much easier for capacity. I get that. But you will forget between each one. So please view them back to back. You will instantly... At the end of those two days, know which one you want to buy. A glorious situation where there's two you really like, but you will definitely find one will stand out to you and the team and you'll really like it and you'll feel that's the one you want to go for. Next, invite that one back for a deep dive demo. A half day workshop, a three hour workshop. You don't need to bring everybody in for that one. Bring in, you know, if it's rostering, bring schedulers in um, and HR people and, and quality people. If it's EMAR, you know, bring in your nurses, your meds people. So then it's a deep dive. You're going to have it on a number of laptops. You're going to touch it and feel it and use it. Um, now you can write yourself a business case. Then a one page, a little, yeah, we're going to spend this much money. We're going to buy it. We're going to be this. This is the supplier we like. Before you sign any contracts, you are going to speak to reference sites. You're going to speak to companies that use that product. And this is imperative. You've got to speak. Go and visit them if they will allow it. And a lot of them will allow it. They really will. They want to show off. So the last step you're going to do is go out and speak to people that use the product. Please don't do it earlier in the process. 
please do it then um, and go out and see them. If there's two products you like and you, you can't you know, choose between them, go and see them for both. And this will help you choose. Um, it also gets around that salesperson thing. Um, if you go out and, and speak to these people, then you will firmly know which one you want to buy. And I, hands on heart, in the experience that I've done this, you know, 113 care companies I've helped procure a piece of software for. And from, from all different sizes and across all the different verticals within social care, this does work. If you go through that, you will find a product you like. Feel like you're compromising. Let's acknowledge this. You might feel that your service is so complex. You do learning disabilities, physical disabilities, autism, and now dementia. You know, you're varied. It's hard to find a product that does everything you want it to, and you're compromising. That's okay. Compromise. The benefits are still there to be had. You're still going to enjoy where it brings you the, uh, the features. Once you've done this, you will have found a product that you want to use. Um, the a word of warning, the, the, the software sector is not wonderfully mature in all areas that we need it to be for social care. So is out there, and let me pick uh, two. I would suggest e-learning. There's not a lot of brilliant e-learnings platforms on the market. There's a lot of average ones, but not a lot of brilliant ones. Um, and the other one would be HR products. Uh, there's a lot of HR products that are great for small care companies, but the moment you get medium size and large, the, the HR products are a little bit naff or really expensive. So don't be afraid also of coming to the end of this and deciding there's nothing out there that's going to work for me. And waiting and seeing is OK. Put a date in the diary to repeat the process in a year's time and see if it's matured. I've done that once ever um, and, it, and it did work because six months later we found a new product and it was fantastic. Um, but hopefully that makes sense. And we, we, I will draw this that you can follow with some real real hacks as you go uh, to speed the process up. A couple of things on that. So just to make sure, uh, obviously, that that cheat sheet that you've highlighted, that's almost like this is the the um, uh, the, the the bird's eye view of the maze. Right. So it gives you kind of the various yes. steps that you need to be able to take from kind of being interested in, in implementing a piece of technology all the way through to the kind of the business end of things where things are starting to get implemented. So that's something that we'll make within uh, make available within the Care Leaders Network uh, and on social media channels where possible. We'll make sure that that's distributed as well so that anyone outside of the Care Leaders Network has the opportunity to be able to download that that cheat sheet. Um, what one thing that uh, Care Leaders Network is our online community is used for endlessly is supplier recommendations, and a lot of the time their conversations either right at the beginning of the of the process or at the uh, the, the the business end of things that that you've been talking about there. In as much as the fact that it's right, we've got this shortlist. Can anyone share some experiences of what it's been like to work with that particular audience? Um, uh, with that particular uh, supplier and then asking the audience within the uh, within the community it's, uh, itself. So for any CLN members, um, make sure that you're utilizing the, the the community within CLN. It's that's that's exactly what it's there for at the uh, at the end of the day. I think your your point there around getting the team to write the spec list or, or I say not just the team, but the um, bringing the residents and their families in, getting them involved in creating that spec list is, is a, is a, is a fantastic point of reference because they're going to be able to paint the picture of what they, what they want. Now are all of their wants, needs, expectations going to be able to met, to be met? Maybe, maybe not, but if the, the large proportion of them absolutely are, then you've got a conversation to be had with the technology company to say, look, this is something that our, our, our the stakeholders within our particular care group are super excited about. Have you got other people asking about this as well? Because potentially we can work together on the on the roadmap and we can collaborate with these different groups of uh, groups of people to make sure that this proposition is robust and this could potentially be part of the development roadmap for the for the future. So I really really like that. I think that's probably my my biggest takeaway from the the, the conversation today because it's. It's the foundational piece of work that will help set the context for all of those discussions moving forward, because you've got the ultimately the people that are going to have the most interaction or the most benefit from the piece of technology uh, involved in that discussion to start off with. And I know from lots of different conversations with people like yourself and other technology suppliers and uh, leaders who have integrated piece of technologies, it's 
it's it's the part of the cultural shift or the cultural transformation that needs to be undertaken to achieve the te technological or digital transformation because you're yeah you're bringing people in on that on that journey which is uh, uh, a such a key part of a successful uh, uh, procurement process but then also integration process thereafter as uh, as well absolutely i'm glad you touched on that so you know a guide innovation we tend to focus our effort on helping care organizations implement technology, which we haven't really talked about. That, that comes next. And if we're involved in the, it is so much easier to implement the technology because of what you've just said. By engaging your teams early, they're starting to hear about the products. They're being listened to. And, and my God, the amount of people that do say, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming out here and spending time with us. No one ever that's our opinions on this and and do do ask the two things it's not just what functionality do you want it's how do you feel definitely ask about that feeling how do you feel if we ask you to carry a tablet around with you at work mm. how do you feel about the idea that your paper notes won't be there anymore or you'll you'll see your roster on an app or you've got to scan your meds or you know how's that gonna make you feel and really listen to that because then, as you said, Simon, the moment you get to the point of implementing the product, the change management is much easier. Remember, we asked you this, you said this, that's why we're doing face-to-face -face training instead of remotely, because that's what meant a lot to you. And, and that really brings your teams along with you on the journey, uh, which is imperative to, to implementation, definitely. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really really key. Maybe we do a whole conversation on uh, technology implementation uh, another uh, another day. But I yeah. guess for, for today's conversation, it's uh, it's very much focused on the uh, on the on on the research and on the procurement side of uh, side of things. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll put a pin in that one uh, as I say for another day. Um, obviously, what we've been talking about so far has been very relevant to care organisations and their care services. I guess if we zoom out for a second and think on almost a, a more macro basis, health and social care integration is a subject that's at the top of most people's agenda at the, at the moment. Can you talk about the technology issues that should be considered when working with an ICS? Because I can imagine that that's something that people are thinking about a, a lot at the moment. And I guess if they're if they're not yet, um, I guess shaping some of the thoughts around why they why they should be. I'm spending a lot of my energy really delving into the ICSs, the ICBs, and what they're trying to accomplish. And, and aren't I disappointed? <laughs> you know, or with these centralised bodies that are meant to be supporting health and social care, um, and, and they haven't worked before, and I'm a bit cynical of the ICSs at the moment. They are going to present opportunities for the sector and huge challenges for the sector as well. Um, a, a stat I, I found, this was a good few months ago now, so it's probably changed. I hope it's changed. 42 ICSs in the in England, two of which have sat at a senior level in them. Um, Sorry, just to, to, to make sure that I've, I've understood that correctly. So with all the ICSs and ICBs, of the 42 of them around the country, there are 40 of them that have no representation. To your understanding, as it stands today, there are, there are, there is no representation in 40 of those 42 ICS, ICBs uh, that have any type of social care representation on that board. Yeah. And, and, and I can see it trickling. It, it, I'm seeing the effect of that trickling through already. I, I got to see a fantastic... Um, elderly service on the Isle of Wight and they just built a new and the NHS through the ICB looked at it and went oh can we have that please you've got nine bedrooms there can we have it for discharge to help with the bed, bed blocking can we can we have that for, to help us get rid of the, the blocked beds in the NHS and you've got to fill these forms in care home to, to accept people from us the forms were NHS really NHS, not the culture of social care. They were not caring in any way. They, they were just detail and horrendously long and not the kind of th stuff that social care uses at all. And this care company was upset that they were having to make their staff use these products. And this is all very relevant to the question, Simon. The data, the ICS is a setup to try and get the data between health and social care to marry up and work and 
what it means in reality, I'm worried, is they're going to start imposing health data onto social care. Hi, social care, you have to now record this, 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 and this in these seven places for us. That's no value to us in social care, um, but, but it's going to happen. And all right, let's be positive for a moment. Thankfully, they looked over the fence at social care and went, oh my gosh, where's the technology? Here's a grant available to digitalize the service user record. Brilliant. A grant, finally, for technology. And I predict more are coming. Um, I predict any deadlines that are put on grants will extend. <laughs> you know, we're not going to digitize as quickly as people think we are. So, you know, I, I think the ICSs are going to give us some money to digitalize. Accept that, everybody. Please <laughs> grab it. Um, there's a new one available that could even hardware and connectivity. So that can help with flooded Wi-Fi in care homes. You know, that that's there now and growing. So, you know, this is great. Fantastic. Do I trust the ICS to harmonize data between the two sectors? Between them, not imposing healthcare onto social care. I don't, I don't think we will. And and allow me to spread my cynicism to our regulators. You know, does anybody remember? Remember the Chloe's? They were nice where they lasted. You know, they're, they're gone as of, was it yesterday, I think? Um, <laughs> Apparently that was the case. But then again, they've all gone on strike or, or at least they're about to go on strike. So I don't know whether they still exist or not. It's kind of, it's a bit of a grey area at the moment. Isn't it? So, you know, CQC are making the noise of data as well. You're going to have to self-report. You're going to have to upload KPIs on a regular basis. Okay, brilliant. What are the KPIs? Oh, we're not quite sure yet, but we think they're going to be these. The first pass the CQC has at this, they will get wrong. Make no doubt, they'll provide a portal. You'll all be given a URL to click on, go to this portal and upload. Brilliant. It won't work. It'll crash. It'll, you know, you'll have a set of data that won't be in the right format. You will have to spend man hours to try and collate data every week or month or however it's going to be. Yeah, we're in for a tricky situation um, coming up, but... We're fantastic in social care. We're leaders. Can I encourage everybody to be engaging their ICS, engaging CQC um, or Care Inspectorate Wales, or wherever you are, engage them, tell them, no, I'm not spending days collating this data for you to upload it to a portal until I know that's working, please. You know, we have power if we push back on these organisations and try and take the reins a little bit from those that are, are doing it at the moment. So... You know, I'm optimistic for the future, but right now it's it's looking a bit bleak. There's definitely some stumbling blocks in amongst all of this, isn't there? Amongst the uh, ICS slash ICVs uh, and then the, the various different regulators, which, of course, uh, all of whom will be, uh, broadly speaking, on this bandwagon. Um, uh, interoperability, um, just to kind of just dig into that a little bit. Can you explain the kind of the put into context exactly what I mean by interoperability with NHS systems and just talk about kind of why that's such a big, likely to be such a big challenge as it stands today. Interoperability is one of our favourite words and not easy to say everyone, don't worry if you can't say it. Um, we have a number of systems and data sets in social care, whether that's HR data in an Excel spreadsheet or, or medication system uh, with, with EMAR and it's sat there. The NHS is the same. They've got an awful lot more systems than we do. They're more digital than us. Fact, they are. So they've got an awful lot of data in a plethora of systems. And that is geographical. It is different as well. And CQC are now going to be giving you a portal to use and your local authority might be asking you to upload data and stuff like that. So, you know, you do have all this. Interoperability is going to be that point of allowing elements of your data to be accessible to those third parties and those third parties making their data accessible to you. Now, this is really exciting. GP Connect is a good example of this, where GPs made data and GP notes available for care organisations to read. And this is through APIs. You know, everyone should know this word by now. It's been banded around a lot, but it's connecting, exposing your data. They expose their data and you connect them through an API. And this is going to be key. This is the way it's going. In social care, we want 
to read paramedics notes as they're driving out to us. And the paramedic wants to read about allergies to penicillin as they're driving out to you rather than when they get to you. That's the future. This is where this is going. The NHS did a massive piece of work. I forget the number, but I want to say seven years. It took them seven years to standardize a citizen. <laughs> and it happened and it was monumental. They've standardized a, a citizen record. So they're in a position now to, to expose that data. And they have. You know, we can all access any care company right now can access the people you support NHS record. You know, that's available to you now through various connections and APIs. So, you know, this is the way it's going. Will the ICBs be mandating it and telling us how to do it and where to do it? Will it be giving us money to do it? I, I don't know. Um, but it's available now. So, you know, if anyone has capacity, uh, you, you want to be exploring these things now. Yeah, I can see why there's, uh, even just from a kind of technological perspective like all of these things are fundamentally possible but there needs to be buy-in from both sides and it has to be the genuine ambition from both sides to to make it all work and we're, we're right on the cusp of this so uh there, there's there's likely to be curveballs there's likely to be changes there's like likely to be sets of circumstances which don't play out the way that maybe people would would hope um the the ultimate goal here is brilliant i guess it's the process that maybe looks a bit bumpy at the uh, at the moment but just Zooming back in from a provider and a care leader perspective, uh, so the people that will be watching this that, that that will gain the most value from this conversation are going to be those people who are looking at digitization, uh, removing the paper from their their the workflows, etc., uh, uh, and building this kind of digital infrastructure, if you uh, if you like. I guess let's let's just wrap up on a, on one particular point for anyone who's in a set of circumstances where they're um, maybe they're 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 umming and ahhing around what to, to do or how to proceed. Um, let's be really specific here. What are the pitfalls of doing nothing? You don't, uh, yeah, as a care leader, you don't have to look far to see the challenge you have right now to digitalize. Your ICS and ICB is saying you've got to. Your regulator is saying you've got to. You know, CQC have said, you know, there's gonna be a point in time very soon that if you show us things on paper, you will not reach good. So, you know, the, the pressure is there. Local authorities are starting to, to mandate this. Your staff, you know, particularly if, if they're the younger generation, their lives are on these. And the, the expectation from to walk in and pick up technology to do my job with. I'm no longer surprised when an elderly person walks into a care home for the first time, arms full of technology. Where do I plug in my Alexa? Do you know the Wi-Fi password? It's wonderful hearing a 90-year-old ask for the Wi-Fi password. You know, it's fantastic. And that's normal. It's becoming even more normal. So the pressure is everywhere for you to do it. And I'm sorry. You, you're going to have to bow to that pressure. You're going to have to do it. If you don't, soon you're going to become non-compliant. Soon your regulator is going to downmark you on the fact that you had to go to a cabinet to pull out a file. Um, you're going to have staff, people you're supporting and their families starting to go, why are you writing that down there? Why can't I log in and see a picture of my loved one and what they did today? You know, that that's becoming normalized and, and you're gonna need to have these tools digital to accommodate that. Because I find it incredibly boring cybersecurity, the data protection um, and GDPR, to have things in different places, to have things on paper soon, that cyber essentials is an accreditation you're just not going to get if you haven't digitalized. So before, Simon, if you'd asked me that three years ago, I'd say, you know, you won't find efficiencies in time saving. You won't reduce costs. Your agency use won't come down. Your med errors won't come down. That's what I used to say. But now that's all changed. And this is the year for it. 2023 is the year for this. Suddenly, it's much worse. You won't be regular. You won't be compliant. You know, you won't be able to hire. People won't come. You won't be safe. So it's sadly, that's the state of it.
And I guess as well, just layering on that, uh, if there was ever a time to do it, whilst there's government funding around to support the cost of these things, uh, that although I, I, I'm sure you're right, the 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 um, the the timelines around these will probably get extended. I'm I'm I'm, I'm of that belief as uh, as well. It's not going to be around, around forever. So um, strike strike now whilst the whilst the funding is is available. So. Super, super valuable conversation. Really, really, really appreciate your uh, your time today. Uh, just breaking down these various different steps and helping answer these questions has been uh, really enlightening for uh, for me as uh, as well. And I'm sure it will be super interesting for for care leaders around the country who are thinking to themselves in the context of where do we go from a from a digital perspective and how do we how do we get through the maze. So, uh, Geraint. Pleasure as always. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, I appreciate all of the insights that you've shared today. Brilliant. Thank you very much.